A warm welcome to this talk. Now, the FDA in the United States has just approved a new vaccine, an mRNA Moderna vaccine, with known serious adverse events and known multiple other adverse events. This is disappointing, to put it mildly. I think we have to assume that the American bureaucracy and the uh, the FDA is more of an oil tanker, which is going to take a while to turn around rather than a sailing yacht, which can tack quickly. Uh, let me immediately give you the evidence for this claim. Here we are. Here, This is the letter granting biological license application approval uh, and really quite a concerning event. Now, this is the... Uh, this is the vaccine here, M N spike. Now, um, you probably worked out from this. This is a an mRNA vaccine that produces spike protein. I know, I know. The lipid nanoparticles will go everywhere. I know. Serious adverse events of this vaccine from the manufacturer's own information. Serious adverse events were reported by two point seven percent of participants. Uh, who received this new vaccine. The comparator vaccine, it was 2.6%. So the new vaccine, 2.7% serious adverse events. The older vaccine that it's replacing, 2.6%. And of course, the, presumably this is a vaccine to combat JN1 variant. Now, let's just... So basically, the FDA has just approved um, a, a preparation here with 2.7%. Uh, incidents of serious adverse events. I would not dream in clinical practice of giving a treatment that had a 2.7% risk of serious adverse events unless there was a really big risk, there was a really big risk-benefit analysis. So if the patient's about to die of something, of course it's an acceptable risk. But for any benefit you would get from this, 2.7%, I just find this bemusing. That this could possibly be uh, be authorised, and um, we we already know, um, we already know from um, other studies the high incidence of uh, adverse events. So this, for example, is um, all adverse events reported to VARES. We see the massive increase when the um, mRNA vaccines were rolled out. Uh, this is the uh, domestic data with uh, deaths after the rollout of the vaccine. Again, massive increase in the VAERS reporting. And uh, this is related to influenza vaccine. 118 times more adverse events were reported compared to influenza vaccine. So how this can be approved is rather a mystery to me, I must say. Um, but it is. Now, fortunately, uh, we've got this information here. This is the... Um, this is what you call the packet insert. It's what the nurses and doctors can see when they give this. So we're able to get quite a bit of relevant information here. Um, this is in the public domain. I've put the link to it, of course. And it tells us quite a lot of interesting facts, which I'm about to sort of try and summarise a little bit because it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, let's start off with that now. Well, that's where we got this information from here to begin with. And that's the medium follow-up of 8.8 .8 months. Now, of course, 8.8 .8 months medium follow-up is not enough to tell us about uh, other adverse events, uh, such as potential malignancies, for for example. So it's a pretty short follow-up in, in terms of that. Participants received either this uh, mRNA-1283, uh, which is the new one, or this mRNA-1273, which is, the, which is the, old, the old Moderna vaccine. Now... <laughs> The key thing here is obviously you can see that what they're doing here is comparing their new vaccine with their old vaccine. Not a placebo. Not a placebo. So they're, compa they're comparing one, one of their vaccines with another one of their vaccines and saying, ooh, isn't this good? We're getting, we're, getting, uh, we're getting benefit from it. This is the clinical trial here. Um, again, you can read that for yourself. It's all there. That is the clinical trial. This is the Moderna report, which is just the industry report on the vaccine. Uh, here's the, more on the study details here. Now, there's some interesting things on this that I'm not going to cover in this video. We'll probably cover it later. There's one I'm concerned about related to uh, pregnancy, but I'm not going to cover that now. That's actually on this one here. 
Um, but we'll, we'll we'll stick to the, the basics on on this one first of all. So, I mean, this is what they're claiming, that 9.3% higher relative vaccine efficacy compared to... But, you know, protecting against what? You know, that it's... Um, so, you know, the, the claim, they're claiming a slightly higher rate of protection. But let's, uh, let's go on and look at some of the uh, side effects and contraindications that this vaccine has. Admittedly, uh, the, the, the manufacturers are admitting uh, have. Contraindications... Do not use MN spike to individuals with a known history of severe allergic reactions. Uh, this is not concerning at all. This is universal. It would always be the case. You never give something, obviously, you never give a drug to something that a patient's allergic to, obviously. So that's not concerning. This is concerning myocarditis and pericarditis. Increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis confirmed. Risk has been highest in males 20, uh, 12 to 24 years of age uh, confirmed but i wouldn't have it even though i'm old onset of symptoms typically in the first week following vaccination typically in the first week following vaccination this is for myocarditis specifically although some individuals with myocarditis and or pericarditis following administration of mrna covid vaccines have required intensive care support see see the way they put this almost as a throwaway although some individuals with myocarditis or pericarditis following administration of mRNA, COVID vaccines have required intensive care support. Then they go on available data suggests individuals typically have resolution of symptoms within a few days with conservative management. So yes, some people have been admitted to um, some people have been admitted to uh, uh, although some individuals with myocarditis or pericarditis following administration have required intensive care support. Some have required intensive care support, but, but hey, don't worry about it. Most, have, most haven't. Now, let me give you the choice. Um, would you like mild pericarditis for a week or not? Available data suggests that individuals typically have resolution of symptoms within a few days with conservative management. In hospitalised patients, so clearly admitting here, if you read between the lines, in hospitalised patients, so there are hospitalised patients, who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, vaccine-associated myocarditis. So clearly admission here that this vaccine-associated myocarditis exists. They're just try, it just appears to me that they're trying to sort of minimise it with the way this is written. Most of these patients had received two primary uh, series of an mRNA COVID vaccine prior to their diagnosis. So, so yes, mo mo most of them have this um, as a... Um, most of them have this as a... An effect after the second vaccine but i wouldn't have one at all now uh, they do quote this paper here cardiac manifestations and outcomes of covid19 vaccine vaccine associated myocarditis in the young in the usa so let's have a quick look at what that is saying uh at a medium follow-up of approximately five months post vaccination persistence of abnormal cardiac magnetic resonance imaging findings that are markers for myocardial injury was common. So basically this is saying using MRI scanning, which is, is very uh, accurate, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging scanning, uh, findings uh, are a marker for myocarditis injury was common. So they're saying on the MRI they can see myocardial damage. And then they say the clinical and prognostic significance of these CMR cardiac magnetic resonance imaging findings is not known uh, information is yet to be available about long term now basically what they're saying is they're seeing lesions in these patients in the myocardium um, now when there's damage to myocardial cells they don't regenerate so those cells are lost for life um, they're, they're lost for life and it can be seen on MRI scanning uh, that they're not going to grow back. Now, over time, well, first of all, that could reduce myocardial overall contractility, reducing fitness. Over time, that could potentially lead to heart failure. And it could also lead to uh, things like heart block and abnormal cardiac rhythms. So it concerns me that on MRI, you're finding uh, markers for myocardial injury. And, and they're clearly admitting that they are finding these markers for myocardial injury. Uh, they don't know about the clinical effects, but I've just expressed my concerns. 
and information about potential long-term harm is not there. Uh, actually, I've just finished that sentence. Long-term sequelae of myocarditis or pericarditis as following administration of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. So they don't know. So um, we, do, we don't know all these things that are risks. Um, we don't know if these myocardial lesions are going to cause illness in the future. But hey, myocardial lesions are an acceptable risk, is what it seems to be saying to me. I just don't get how they can be taking such risks, to be quite honest. Um, I don't get it. But they're saying they don't know, but hey-ho, carry on anyway. Uh, never mind the torpedoes, full steam ahead. Never mind the icebergs, let's get to New York on time. All right, syncope, okay, that doesn't concern me. Fainting is a known adverse effect, of course, with anything. Um, altered immunocompetence, immunocompromised persons, including individuals receiving immunosupportive therapy, may have diminished immune response, so it might not work very well in immunocompromised persons. Limitations of the vaccine uh, may not protect all vaccine part <laughs> recipients. So here they're admitting that uh, M next spike uh, is going to run the risk of these adverse events and it might not work in some people anyway adverse reactions less common uh, less severe adverse reactions uh, most common so this is greater than 10 percent reported adverse reactions now this is in the uh, 12 to 17 year old age group and i've put the older age group 18 to 65 in brackets so um, pain at the site of injection Older people, 74.8%. Younger people, 68.8%. Pretty high. Headache. About half of people are going to get headache. Fatigue. Nearly half are going to get fatigue, or over half if you're in the older age group. Myalgia. Painful muscles. Again, getting on for half. Th th these are common. I mean, if you had a bit of, you know, if you had all these things at the same time, you'd feel pretty rough. Auxiliary swelling in the armpit, presumably due to the lymph nodes. About a quarter, but more in the younger age group. Chills, presumably meaning the body's getting a fever. Again, round about 31% well, in the younger age group, 24% in the older age group. Uh, achy joints and uh, nausea and vomiting. I mean, these these um, these are described as the minor ones, but they're common. Um, some of them could be symptomatic of things going on in the immune system. Um, I really don't know why they would uh, want to run these risks. Um, now, here's their comparisons. The basically, uh, 12 to 17-year-olds, the new vaccine is here. This is the new vaccine in this group here. And this is the old vaccine in this group here. And, and the, the, the range of adverse effects are, are comparable. So um, such high incidence of adverse events appears to be acceptable with the risk of myocarditis, with the 2.7% chance of severe, severe adverse reactions. I mean, that's just quite incredible. Serious adverse events, 2.7%. That's okay, mate, we'll pass that for you. I, I really don't get this. I really don't get it. Um, lots of other information there. This is the side effects in the 18 to 64-year-olds. And again, comparable in the, in the new vaccine to the old one. And that's quite a nice substat article from uh, Mary and uh, uh, De, De Macy that I um, read this morning as well. So um, really quite, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, I, I would call this, um, I don't know, is it hubris? Is, is it, um, what is it? 2.7% risk of serious adverse events for essentially or very, very limited benefit in the age groups and the risk profile that this vaccine is recommended for. Um, anyway, there we go. That's, that's that paper. Just as an aside... ...de déclaration um, des effets indésirables pour la grippe et la COVID-19 en va. Voici le nombre de réactions, le nombre d'effets indésirables, et nous le voyons multiplié par 118. Comme nous l'avons mentionné, le nombre de vaccins administrés a été multiplié par 2,3. So I know there's a bit of echo on that, but it just shows that uh, YouTube videos are now available in a multiplicity of languages. So if English isn't your first language, uh, click on the buttons and you can get me talking in various different languages, which is quite amusing, of course. 
Um, so there we go, new vaccines passed, despite knowing the risks. I am disappointed in the FDA, I must say. Um, maybe this reflects the massive financial interest in this. I don't know. Um, but if you were my patient and there was a completely minimal risk, a completely minimal benefit from a procedure, there's no way I'd give you a 2.7% risk of uh, serious adverse events and, and, and risk of myocarditis or pericarditis, not to mention all the other ones, fatigue, uh, headache, achy muscles, achy joints, chills, nausea, vomiting, fever. Nah, I'm not going to have it. Let me know what you think. If you're going to take it, let me know. But for now, with disappointment in the FDA, thank you for watching.